Hey guys, thank you for joining me on another episode of Damien Stevens Live Show. I'm very excited for the guest we have today, but before we dive in, I want to just uh, let everyone know that we are sharing our thoughts and prayers for everybody that's impacted by Hurricane Ian, uh, the actual hurricane, not the guest we have today. Um, and uh, and so uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to you, and we know that that MSPs that are listening may be either hunkered down or they may be the actual people that are doing the cleanup and the prep. So I know you guys are the, the un, unsung heroes. Um, so that being said, drop your comments in. This is a live show. We'll be taking your questions. Um, and so if you, if you want to know more, if you want to dig in further, please do that. So a different Ian altogether here uh, is Ian Richardson. And so he was the CEO of, of Doberman Technologies, and he built that up to a couple million run rate. Uh, he made all the lists you'd want to make from an MSP top 501, CRN 250, and even Joe Panettieri's healthcare list where uh, he built a boutique MSP. But it wasn't always easy. So with that in mind, let me bring in Ian. Ian, hey, hey, Damien. thanks for How's being here going, today. Man? Oh, thanks for having me, man. And uh, speaking on behalf of all Ians, this hurricane is not representative of us, and I'm going to take its name back at some point. They got to, they should really name these things like a series of numbers or something, name and names. It's like, what? how come I drew the short straw and just <laughs> demolished Florida, man? That ain't cool. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. And I was like, what are the odds that we planned this, you know, quite some time ago? And, and uh, <laughs> then it's like making landfall, you know, right as, uh, so we probably have either MSP super busy prepping for it, or we have folks that are, you know, like hunkered down for it, depending on where they are. So, so yeah, yeah. that's, it's funny. I think you may not want to, you know, it's, I wonder how much that influences naming of children per year, you know? Well, yeah. Yeah. It's, um, uh, I remember hurricane Andrew and I have a, I have a cousin Andrew and he was always a little bit like, I didn't get the sensitivity to it until now that it's actively happening. And it's like, man, I, don't like having my name associated with that that's not i'm not okay with that so right you're right. if you're listening noah cut it out <laughs> that's right that's exactly right be, go away be a non-remarkable storm all right yeah like why don't you why don't you be a nothing burger and oh it turned out to see and everyone's fine that would be that would be a much better ian story but. yeah yeah hopefully it doesn't do much more than it's already done it's been some yeah. interesting stories uh yeah yeah so um, so I, I talked about all of the, or a lot of the good things, not all the good things, but all the things that sound cool, all the things that people like to talk about, about making all the lists and growing revenue to, you know, when you start, what sounds like this crazy number, but tell me how you got started. Tell me a little bit about Doberman and what that looked like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, um, the 10,000 foot view, uh, I think probably will sound pretty similar to, to some folks who are, who are tuning in today. Um, I started Doberman as a moonlighting thing when I was, uh, I founded it when I was 21, I was working at a local night school and the way I paid for the night school is that they gave me a free credit or a fleet, a free class or two a term. And so I worked during the day, I take a course at night. Um, and my old boss, a guy named Tom field, uh, said, Hey, you know, like you're doing all this stuff on the side, you're helping out professors on the side, whatever you need to go form a business to give yourself a little bit of legal protection. And then more importantly, you can write off your gas. You can write off a bunch of different stuff. It'll help you out on your taxes. And right. So I took that advice and I went and, uh, formed Doberman and, um, the name is always something people ask about, like, hey, did you have Dobermans or whatever? I, I was tangentially around Dobermans. I didn't grow up with them. We had golden retrievers at our house, but I always liked dogs. And back, even in um, even when I was 21, I had awareness of a, of a law, uh, which is CFR 45, which is the HIPAA, federal, the, the Federal Portability and Privacy Act um, around health information. And, um, when I was sitting there like, okay, you got to name this business. Like, I don't want it to be my initials. I don't want it to be nerds or geeks or something like that. I, right. I like dogs. So maybe, you know, I like animals. I like dogs. Maybe I'll do a dog and I'm like, okay, well, Rottweiler is a little, 
like drooly pit bull everyone's kind of scared of and i knew i wanted kind of a, a tough dog to represent security based off of my understanding of that code back then and so doberman stuck out as hey it's this it's a tough dog it's a good looking dog it'll feel good people will feel safe so hence the name um and so flash forward to 2010 I had, uh, I had I had finally gotten through night school, gotten through undergrad, managed to get through those debt free because of that those couple free credit hours from here and there, and I was working still at that night school. In a by the job way, I just wanted really... to highlight, not interrupt, but just want to highlight Morgan was just like huge dog fan. Was just about <laughs> to ask that. That's awesome. There we go. There we go. That's that's the story behind the name. Um, and so. I, w- I was at a job where there was no there was no vertical movement, there was no lateral movement. It wasn't really in alignment with what I enjoyed. And so, um, right at the end of 2009, being the super intelligent financial genius I am, in the end of a recession, I said, "Hey, I'll quit this stable, nice job with benefits and a pension and and all that type of stuff, and then dive in and do this business full time." And right, that's that's what got us here today. Uh, that first year, I think maybe I made. 40,000 or something. It's a, it's an embarrassing, it's an embarrassing revenue figure. I, I did not know what I was doing, but oh, that wasn't your, pay. that wasn't, let me be clear. That wasn't your, that wasn't your take home salary. No, no, that was at the top. That was the top line <laughs> revenue. Yeah. That was yeah. the top line revenue. It was like 40 grand or 50 grand or something, yeah. something terrible. It's like, That's Ooh, that... this is, this is bad. <laughs> the, the ramen noodles, Tom's right there, right? Oh, oh yeah. Ramen noodles, <laughs> mac and cheese, microwave pizza, whatever. Like, yeah. That's terrible for you. Yeah. That's one of the worst parts about IT too is, is how terrible we have a, a tendency to treat our bodies. Mm-hmm. Like it's, you're sitting in a chair for eight, 10, 12, 16 hours a day. You're doing that for five, six, seven days a week. You're not necessarily going to the gym. You might not even be going outside. The the IT tan is a is a real thing. Um, the sysadmin tan, and and so kind of making sure that we um, take a little bit better care of ourselves is something that I'm incredibly conscious of today. Which which uh, yeah, rice and beans uh, <laughs> on toast, on toast, beans on toast. The the typical English meal. That's right. Um, yeah. And just wanted to give yeah. a quick shout out. Anybody else want to drop in comments? And Elijah said hi to both of us who wants to, wants to learn as much as possible today. So awesome. Keep, keep awesome. the comments coming. For sure. For so sure. Tell me how about you went from this amazing forty fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year company <laughs> to, you know, like there, there, there had to be some, some steps in between there. Yeah. Yeah. So we, um, so when I when I dove in full time, um, I did not know what I was doing. Um, I didn't know what I was doing in terms of engineering design, even though I kind of thought I did. I didn't know what I was doing in terms of marketing, in terms of sales, finance, anything. I was it was very. I didn't have. I'd, I'd gone through an undergrad in business administration. So I knew the basics of accounting and, you know, debits and credits and balancing the books and, you know, double entry accounting features. I knew some basics about marketing and, hey, you have to have a, a message or whatever and, and, and come up with some strategy. But I didn't do any of the intentional work, like sitting down with a sheet of paper or a whiteboard or a blank word document and wrote anything out. It was all just bumping around in the noggin. And because of that, I succeeded in spite of myself, not because of myself. So there was a lot of like, hey, there's this business. And I I always imagine the business is like a pyramid in the ground. Mm -hmm. And instead of kind of saying like, all right, well, let's lift this up and put it on wheels and maybe push it. Mm -hmm. I was just out in front with a rope dragging the thing through the (laughs) sand. And sometimes I would drag harder than others. And that's what kind of grew it for the first five or six years was just sheer determination, grit, and uh, sweat, blood, and tears. Yeah. And going at this, like being in uh, in my third or fourth entrepreneurial endeavor now, um, it's a lot easier if you don't do that. <laughs> it's like a, a, an ounce of planning is worth a ton of uh of of muscle grit and determination just that little bit of preparation work can really make it like you grease the skids so 
So what would you do differently in those first few years? Well, so that's, um, I'm doing that now. Like uh, a big thing that we didn't do is we never wrote down stuff. We didn't write from, hey, this is the way you set up a computer or this is the way you install backups or, or whatever, like a technical procedure. We didn't do that. We didn't document customer sites in a standardized way. We didn't do projects in a standardized way. We didn't even work a ticket or an incident in a standardized way. So on the tech end, it was very wild, wild west. And we just didn't believe in process. It was, it was a bunch of nonsense. Who cares? Who needs that? And these days, I mean, all, all I've done for the past year at my, at my current endeavor is figure out what a process is from a blank sheet of paper, write it out, and then say, okay, does this need procedures to show how the steps do? Do we need to make pictures? Do we need to have videos? Like, even though I'm the guy who's operating in it, and Carrie, my wife, is, is the person who's operating in it, we've really said, hey, the mistakes we've made the first go around was not setting up the infrastructure, setting up things so that tasks can be migrated. And uh, that's, that's the biggest tip that I have is, is take some time, write it down. Don't worry about it being perfect. Just get it written down so that you can manage to it. You can review it. You can hold people accountable, including yourself to it. Just document those processes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, keep the comments coming. I've got one from Elijah saying, uh, Ian, do you leverage in internal or external sales? Was that you? And I'm going to add to that while you answer that. You kind of set this amazing $40,000 in revenue year one, and then you mentioned struggling the first five years. Tell, tell us about the, you know, the journey to 2 million. And you know, where, what I'd like to add to Elijah's is like, were you the, the only salesperson or how did that, you know, sales easy for you? Is that an actual? Yeah. So, well, sales is definitely, so sales, just like engineering or technical writing or HR is a skill. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a, it's not a, a quote unquote God given talent. It, it doesn't just pop in. It's, it's a muscle. Mm -hmm. So just like when you first do a push up, it might be a little bit of a struggle bus and you can do five or six of them. And if you ask me to do push ups today, I can bang out a hundred, 200 of them and be like, all right, let's, let's go for a run now guys. Um, but the first couple is the hardest part of it. And it's much more important to remember that form follows function so you got to get fun you got to get the technical skills down pat have to learn how to go through the whole cycle of the push-up or the whole cycle of your sales process before that process becomes muscle memory and, and, and it's easy to just shift gears and pivot and whatever so mm -hmm. um to answer the question uh at 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 my current company um it's all internal at at Doberman, my MSP, it was me from 2005 when I founded it all the way up until 2000, end of 2016. I didn't have anyone else involved in any single part of sales. I brought on an account manager in 2017 that failed horribly. I tried <laughs> to bring on an outside sales rep that failed horribly. Mm -hmm. I took it back in 18, 19, and 20. I brought on another account manager who did a bit better um but still failed uh just not as horribly mm -hmm. and uh and took the sales back on the one thing that worked well um i engaged a couple outside marketing companies that that failed horribly too um the one thing that worked relatively well is when i outsourced a part of my sales process to uh manage sales pros which is my wife's uh, uh call center business and that succeeded again in spite of myself. And that's mainly due to their focus on their processes. So with sales or with your help desk or with your backups or whatever, you kind of want to make sure that you have the operational maturity both in your house as well as at a partner. If you're evaluating a partner or a, an employee, whatever, you need to make sure that there's that maturity level and that understanding of how the process will flow so that everything can gel together and everything can work. Um, all of my sales failures stemmed from me. It, my account managers weren't bad people. They might have been in the wrong chair or it might have not have been the, the right seat or, or the right cultural fit, but 
despite that, the number one reason why they failed, the number one reason why anything in my business failed was it resided at my desk. And it's easier for me to see that now that I'm out of that house and kind of looking back in the mirror. It was a it was a lack of intentional focus and a lack of holding myself accountable and slowing down a bit to move fast mm -hmm. instead of always being in a rush. Um, the urgent became much more important than the important in my world. And I fell into that trap over and over and over again. Um, tell tell so, me about you guys feel free to drop in comments. So take your questions. Tell me about you became a boutique healthcare mm -hmm. focused, right? If I understand, yep. did you start that way? If you did, how the heck did you know to start in healthcare or why? And uh, uh, yeah, how do you, you know, I've, I've talked to so many MSPs, they're like, I can't do that. Uh, you know, I'd be turning yeah. down so many customers. Yeah, so um, healthcare was a family business for me. So my dad, uh, when he was alive, was a, a family practitioner, which is a specialty in medicine it, um, that is about, managing someone's wellness. So you might you might be familiar with general practitioner. That's just someone who kind of went through med school. A family practice doc has the same sort of residency requirements as a cardiologist or someone else. It's a specialty. And he, um, he ran his own medical practice, this little four doctor and a couple of mid-level practice in a town called Holt, Michigan. And um, the, and, and my mom, when I was growing up, was a neonatal intensive care nurse. So the babies that, um, that are born healthy just go into the mother's room and then eventually go home. Sometimes babies might need like a little bit of half-day care or whatever. But if you're ending up in the NICU as a child, if you're a preemie or you've got a significant health risk, that's where my mom worked. And so um, the majority of the babies that she cared for weren't gonna make it wow and that's like the knowledge in that space is that hey this kid isn't gonna make it and so that's wow. the environment that i that i grew up in and so from my mom's side the ambulatory side i kind of understood about hospitals um there was a an early understanding about death in my family and what's involved in that um and from my dad's side it was entrepreneurship and business and kind of that that focus and things like that um but growing up in that household things like revenue cycle management and insurance reimbursements and claims management and uh you know um talent retention and how do we grow an ma to an lpn to an rn to whatever and and in and out of hospitals and stuff like that was just that was my normal Mm -hmm. And so many times when someone's like, oh, yeah, I've got this little thing or whatever, I'll just rattle off all this information about it. And they go, are you a doctor? I said, oh, no, no, I just, it just grew up, right? Like, hey, you're sick. Okay, go to bed, stay in bed, try to sleep as often as possible, drink twice as much fluids, make sure you're drinking juice along with water and clear chicken broth. You'll be fine in two days. <laughs> the secret and someone will be there. like, yeah, someone's like, okay, doctor -y. And it's like, well, no, not a doctor. That's what my dad told me to do. It's not what I, it's not what I did, right? Um, but just growing up in that sort of an environment, you sponge in just like any child does, you sponge in all that stuff. And so after Doberman, I really got started in IT at 14. I was installing my dad's EMR. It was one of the second or third ones in the state of Michigan off of floppy disks downstairs in a basement. I was installing an old medic system. Mm -hmm. That's how I cut my teeth in it. So EMRs and practice management and revenue cycle management and all those sorts of things. I just grew up knowing that. Mm -hmm. I grew up knowing charting systems. And so when I would go in and talk with a doctor, I'm like, hey, how often are you getting asked to buy something in quarter one? You guys are probably a C-Corp and you bonus out and you're on the line of credit until April or May, right? And just like yeah. that, you're able to relate it to them and they're like, this guy gets me. Yeah. And so I landed piece of business after piece of business after piece of business and I use that as a strategy as well as reaching out to the big EMR player in our town, which is a, a little itty bitty company called Allscripts that probably no one on the call has ever heard of, a massive player. Um, 
But I, I just reached out to the EMR vendor and said, hey, like we do this thing, we've got six, seven, eight, 10, 12 of your clients. Can we be of service at any point? Like they don't need to sign a contract. We're just happy to help out. And those local sales reps would start calling us when a different IT provider would drop the ball. So they would bring us in and say, well, now have these guys come in. They'll help you manage it. And invariably they would jump over because of the knowledge and the relationships and, and the focus on healthcare. That's awesome. Um, I just wanted to throw out a comment from Elijah. He said, that's why I was getting it wrong with generating sales leads may need some coaching. Thanks for that feedback. So, um, keep the comments coming. I know we've had a number of folks join us, so, uh, feel free to jump in. This community is what we're here for. Any questions, fair game. And, uh, the team here, my team here at Serocity is actually, um, going to, drop all the different things that uh, Ian's talking about, whatever he, whatever resources he's talking about. So if you want those, stay tuned to the end. We'll be able to, to get those for you. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to feature another one from Morgan again, saying it was hard. It seems so hard to admit that. W would you say self-awareness and accountability contributed to your success? That's not natural skill. How did you learn to do that? Yeah, so... Um... Accountability, accountability and, and self-awareness is not a natural state for me, and, and it's relatively new. So there's, um, like, the number one reason why I have any sort of ability to self-reflect, I would say, is a significant amount of time spent in therapy. Um, and that's, that's just to, to work through them things. So we were talking about that growth path to get to 2 million. We got to 2 million pretty quick. We didn't have great bottom line profit. And one of the biggest um, investments in myself, and, and I'd encourage any MSP that gets to a, a, a seven figure revenue to consider it is we went and joined a peer group. I joined HTG, which is Arlen Sorensen's group. It's now IT Nation Evolve. And I did that back um, in 2016. And the first meeting I walked in, I was, you know, young and cocky and brash and thought I knew it all. And these guys are like, hey, congratulations, you've built yourself a really expensive job. You don't have a business. <laughs> like, there's no profit down at the bottom. What are you doing? You're, you're doing tech work. You're doing this. You're doing that. You need to get out all this type of They just raked me over the coals. But it's what I needed. Yeah. And so over the course of the next few years, we kind of kept that revenue at the top steady, but then focused on bottom line profit and grew it, you know, from break even to 5% to 10% to 20% to 25% where we were cooking at a better than best than class margin. So that not only am I finally paying myself a fair wage, but I'm taking home a half million dollars a year in profit. And yeah. that was that was a, a real big tipping point. But throughout those years, when I started focusing more on trying to build a business and, and put things in place, there's a cost to that. Um, mm -hmm. And so, like, I let myself go physically. I'm about 60 pounds lighter than I was back in 2019. Um, I'm, I'm in way better physical shape, but mentally and emotionally and, and in terms of a family connection, there's just a lot of things that I ignored or put to the side or, or didn't pay attention to. I didn't pay attention to my son as he was growing up. I was working six, seven days a week, 12, 16 hour days. I didn't pay attention to my ex-wife. I didn't pay attention to our household. I didn't pay attention to our marriage. I didn't pay attention to focusing on building a retirement account. I was just pouring all the profit back into the business to try to focus on growth and and maintaining things and and hiring better people and going going after bigger logos and stuff like that and because of that um it really welled up in a in a significant way uh in, in 2019 my marriage failed not in a in a pleasant way in a spectacularly massive fashion I went through a very acrimonious divorce um, and it, the business suffered. I suffered. My son suffered. Um, one of the hardest memories I have was that after uh, my ex and I were living in separate residences, I brought him in. I 
dropped them off over at our old house, which is where her and, uh, and my son were staying. Went back out to the car, realized I had forgotten something. I went back inside and I saw him standing there in his mom's arms, just, mom's arms, just breaking down, crying, and that like that that tore my heart out. And that sort of yeah. lack of focus on what's truly important really resonates today. Um, my dad got sick back in 2012. He had a, a spinal fungal infection, which sounds crazy and essentially it's just like there's different types of infections and one of them is is a fungus just like a mushroom on the ground and it got inside his spinal column he was in the hospital for six to eight months ended up in a wheelchair and he could walk but he um part of the impact of that sickness was he lost his ability to be an effective diagnostician and healthcare provider so he was forced into a little bit of an early retirement and that tore the soul out of him he became a a shell of a man he never really recovered he never focused on physical recovery he never focused on mental recovery he just kind of sat in his wheelchair for the next 10 years until he died and um that hit home with me after it had been going on for a while i kind of slowly but surely disconnected from him and and formed a bigger and bigger gap between my father and I and that resonates now with a like you you can't be the job you can't be an IT engineer you can't be a business owner you can't be an MSP owner you can't be this career focused definition because that's not what's gonna matter at some point Mm-hmm. It's going to like, it will change. Um, I'm a big fan of, of stealing other people's lines. And Arlen's a huge fan of saying everybody exits from their business, either vertically or horizontally. And my dad might have walked out of his business or been carried out of his business, but he exited horizontally. He never kind of disconnected and redefined himself. And so when I, when I went through that nasty divorce, part of going down to rock bottom in a divorce is, is asset settlement. And um, it looked pretty likely that I would have to fire sale or liquidate Doberman, which is a company I had for a long time that was my ego. Mm-hmm. And when you go through that, you have to disconnect yourself. So it's a, okay, I'm not going to own this anymore. I'm not going to be an IT provider anymore and if i sell this to someone else i'm not going to work i don't want to work for some other msp that's not my goal so i'll do the bare minimum i have to do to honor the court's judgment if i'm told i have to sell it but then i'm I'm out and i recognized enough to know okay you're gonna have a non-compete so you can't just go start another one so you're gonna have to do something else and that's a exercise that every entrepreneur goes through in their own way um Jameson West, a, a guy I know, I think wrote a book around the emotional side of selling a business. That might be a good resource to kind of think through that. Um, but the, you go through this exercise where you have to disconnect yourself from a significant portion of your ego. Like a big part of Ian Richardson was Ian Richardson, the owner, CEO, founder, the guy at Doberman Technologies. Right. It's your baby. And by the time I, yeah, right. And yeah. when I, bounced out of that that wasn't me anymore i had already disconnected from the business and so when we the dust has settled on divorced i'd retained ownership of doberman it wasn't my passion anymore Mm -hmm. because i had gone through that same exercise that every entrepreneur goes through but i didn't actually sell it yeah and so the next year after that divorce um Like I I can easily put myself back into there. There was a lot of mental health struggles. I I wrestled quite a bit with depression and uh, depression's a interesting space when you're, when you're at the bottom of it, if you haven't experienced it, it's tough to, it's tough to share it. Everybody's been depressed, but if you haven't experienced depression, depression's kind of like being in a pool and you're in the middle of the pool and there's nothing to float on. And then you forget how to swim. And so you kind of keep going under the water. That's a great analogy. And when you get down to the bottom of the pool, you can kind of push yourself back up. But 
sometimes you might not close your mouth in time it feels like you're choking on water it's it's kind of dark there's no light in the pool house anymore and that's that's what depression feels like is you forget how to swim and eventually you remember but while you don't know how to swim that's not terrifying that's like it's something different your brain shuts down there and it's almost well this is all that there's gonna be this is my life and I just got to deal with it or, and, and, and sometimes people can't. And that's really what leads, uh, at least in my limited sandbox experience towards explorations of not, not continuing forward of, of pursuing suicide or something similar. And so when I dove out of my divorce and I'm in that middle of that pool bobbing like this, one of the big questions is, is what the hell's the point of all this? Pardon, pardon the French. Sorry. Sorry, yeah. live. <laughs> um, what am I doing? This is, this is all bull. Um, I, I don't like this business. I don't know what I'm doing. I like uh, my kids upset. I'm upset. I, my ex-wife and I hate each other. Like what's the point? And a few months earlier, I'd, I'd planned on going out to um, Patterson Center over in Denver, which is a, a, a center founded by Pete Richardson and a couple other guys to preserve and train on Tom Patterson's body of work. Tom's, um, Tom's dead now, but he's like one of the greatest strategic minds ever. I think he was called by, by um, Peter Drucker, which is anyone who works in the strategy world knows that Peter Drucker is kind of like the godfather of strategy. That's uh that, that is, that is the Mecca right there is, is trying Feel, to approach. feels like he created management. <laughs> the yeah. idea of it. Yeah. Peter Drucker. Right. So, yeah. And so Tom built out that, like, if you look at Tom's story, he, he worked for it. He did a lot of different interesting things and, and you can go to Patterson center, uh, com slash heritage. If you want to watch a video about that, that's a, a good resource. But Tom went through a lot of things. He built this tool set called Stratop, which I got introduced through, through HTG and a guy named Israel Lang, who is my facilitator and, um, a bit of a mentor and, and installed Stratop at Doberman for us. That's how I was able to grow that bottom line profit successfully was using that tool set. And one of the things I'd been exploring kind of throughout the divorce is, okay, if I got to do something else, what might I want to do? I might want to do this. And I went out and got started the certification process on becoming a guide. And the first step to that is you go do a personal Stratop called a life plan, which is a business plan for your life. And so I had booked that months ago, but it, here it is, October 1. I think I went out there 10th of October, and I emailed the gentleman there who's a guy named Michael. He's the vice president of product and research over there. I said, hey, like, I just went through this. I don't know if we can accommodate this, but this is really what I would take the most value from now. And he said, no problem. Come on out. And he and I sat down for a couple days in his basement in his house and dove deep and one of the key questions i said is i don't understand what the word legacy means like i don't understand why i'm here i don't necessarily have a strong religious faith so that's not something i can kind of fall back on like i don't mm -hmm. get it yeah and taking those couple of days to explore who is ian richardson the man the the father the the person uh the now husband to carry like who who am i and what is that really was what kind of bubbled me up out of that to say like look you you don't want to run an it company you don't want to be a technologist what you really care about is helping people and you really want to help i don't want to be the guy i want to be the guy's guy uh, to describe it. So I don't want to be president. I'd much rather be like chief of staff um, or a senior advisor. That's kind of the, the place where I'm at. And um, my personal mission statement that kind of drove out of that is, look, if I can help enough different people in enough different ways that the world's a better place, that's a life well spent. And so exactly. long story, long story long, Morgan, <laughs> yeah. that's, um, that's, that's kind of some of the, th some of the things. Another big part of that is through my divorce and after my divorce, I joined a different type of peer group. So HTG is an 
industry peer group. Mm -hmm. I joined an organization called Entrepreneurs Organization or EO, which is uh, I think founded by Vern Harnish a while back. And that's, um, they say EO is not therapy. You know what it is? It's CEO therapy. It's entrepreneurial therapy. That's right. <laughs> Just a bunch of business owners getting in a room and we're all complaining for, uh, to use a polite phrase, we're all complaining yeah, about our businesses, yeah. about our spouses, about our lives, about woe is me, look at my first world problems. But yeah. it taught me a set of reflection skill set, kind of asking myself why four or five different times. So, well, I am mad. Okay, why am I mad? Well, because this happened. All right, well, why does that bother me? Well, this is why. Well, why does that bother me? And invariably, you're kind of getting down to childhood or trauma or things like that. That's usually where all of this stuff stems from. But it taught me that ability to look inward and ask those questions. Um, my therapist that I went through, through divorce and stuff like that, it, it really, um, her name's Lauren. She taught me quite a bit of communication techniques so that if I was in a period of conflict, employee, relationship, just having conflict, um, having a, a fierce conversation, it taught me how to slow down and make sure I'm understanding right and not assuming that I know what someone else is saying, things like that, and, and being able to recognize the trauma in my own life that causes some of the behaviors that are both good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, so th therapy was another, uh, another big part of that. Um, and just... When I went and first joined EO, a woman named Patty Campagna, who's a EO trainer, she trains you how to participate in that organization. We went out um, and did training. There's a group of folks there. And Patty said something at the start of the room, at the start of the first day of training, it was a two-day training that stuck with me and I'm a big fan of today. And she said, if you want to be able to get value out of a room, if you want to be able to form a rapport, if you want to be able to take more than you put in from something, you got to get naked fast. And she's obviously not talking about physically getting naked, but just cut through it, be raw, be vulnerable, expose that portion of yourself. Because if you do, you can then cut past the, the barriers, either perceived or real, that someone else has and get to the crux of the problem or, or form a rapport or gain some value. And so I just really, really honed in on that line and tried to develop that skill of like, okay, I don't have to impress anyone. I don't have to show off or present a certain face. I can just say like, hey, I'm Ian. I, I've, I miscommunicate. I get angry. I get impatient. I screw up in these ways i've failed in these ways and preach, preach it i feel yeah. you that's exactly yeah. right um so i think the more of us that do that and admit we're not perfect we do have whether it's bouts of depression or miscommunication in which are very different things but just all of these things um the bet the healthier will be um, I wanted to say drop more comments. We've got some great ones coming in. Elijah is saying, man, you know, divorce really builds character. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Morgan's, you know, thanking you for sharing about mental health. I want to thank you, too. I mean, that, it's obviously so important. Some people kind of consider it taboo to, to just be mm -hmm. flawed and be an individual. Um, I wanted to highlight Justin, who... Um, just saying, you know, you're talking about all the exercise and the self-development mm -hmm changed his life. So um, I think that was something you were alluding to as well. Um, and then uh, Jonathan wanted to know the book you were mentioning. I believe that was the one, uh, the Tim Patterson book. Oh, and so it's not a, it's not a, um, so, so Tom Patterson, it's not a, it's not a book. Um, so pattersoncenter.com. Mm -hmm. And if you do forward slash heritage, it'll just, it's a good seven minute video. Yeah. about Tom's life. If you're curious about Tom and, and that organization and what kind of um, did that, like that's, that's a seven, that's a, 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 if you don't find value from that seven minute spend, like, let me know and I'll buy you a coffee next time I see you. Right. Like I'll, yeah. I'll owe you a coffee. I'll buy you a beer, whatever, um, whatever it might be. That's kind of a key piece. And, and I think it was Justin who mentioned that there, there's some fundamental things that changed his life. There's a, a concept out of Tom's body of work, called the renewal cycle. Mm -hmm. You just think about it like these things, if, if you're in the center of a wheel 
and you've got little spokes out, right? That kind of support the tire as, as you go around, you got that center point. I'm, I'm not a car guy, so <laughs> everyone can make fun of me for my lack of knowledge of wheels and how this stuff works. But if you think about it, like the wheels going around and if one part of the wheel is broken or unhealthy, like you almost have a bump, right? And you're kind of getting a jostly ride. So you, you want to have that inflated tire. You want to make sure your, your axle's not all messed up or whatever. And so the renewal cycle, like figuring out the three, four, five things that really refresh you in an intentional way and kind of refill that gas tank is important. Um, and like one of mine is routine exercise and, and really it mean like routine. I mean, every day, if I go to the gym every day and if I'm doing the gym at the start of the day, even if it's a struggle bus to get there and even if it's like whatever, like I'm sore, I'm not feeling well, I'm just going to spend 60 minutes on the recumbent bike and I'm not going to really push it. I'm just kind of a little phone it in just the act and the routine and almost the ritual of going there makes the rest of the day better same thing with diet like if i eat trash or too much carbs or too much dairy and stuff like that i feel bad mm -hmm. but if it's vegetables and protein and fruit and stuff like that and i stick on that diet i'm usually higher energy i'm higher creative i'm higher productivity so there's there's a few smaller more daily routine things uh, one of the things carrie and i do is we take a weekend a month and it's just uh, like, this is a non-device weekend. It's it, like Friday, whenever we stop working, it's we shut down the laptops. We'll talk to our kids and stuff like that. But we like, sometimes we just straight up remove email off the phones so we don't get the notification, no social media. We're not watching TV. It's like, hey, we're just going to go do some stuff. And so it's, let's go explore town. Let's go to a fair. Let's might be reading books out on the porch quietly, but it's an intentional connection between us and that really kind of helps keep us connected and refills both of our tanks um, a bit and so if you're able to figure out what those things are that refresh you and renew you and, and really help you stay in a state of health do those things and kind of hold yourself accountable to those things like set a couple of smart goals right that specific measurable attainable relevant time bound goal Mm -hmm. set those around you because the one thing about working out or learning something or person like personal development it is the single thing on the planet that you cannot outsource right you outsource everything else you can't outsource personal development no one can do it for you they can encourage you they can nag you they could do it with you but you got to show up and do it yourself and if you do that like after a while, you'll start to feel the benefits. There's no like, hey, I'm 100% better. It's just you're 1% better than you were the day before to boost the atomic habits term. So like, and that's all you got to focus on is just put one step in front of the other when it comes to that stuff. It's almost like compound interest. It's paying off there, right? For sure, man. Compound interest. Like you want to you get your kids excited about retirement, give them a Pokemon card for every time they solve a compound interest problem. There you Spoiler go. Spoiler alert. That's what I do with my son. <laughs> that's awesome. I like that. Huh? That life hack. Oh, yeah. He's like, hey, can I do 10 compound interest problems? You sure can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I stole one recently from somebody else. Uh, my kids th think they're getting over on me because I'm paying them like two bucks for every chapter book they read. And they're like, uh -huh. what if I read like 10 of them? You're going to give me 20 bucks. You're like, yep. Take all my money 100%. you want. You know, like go that's for right. it. So read a, read a hundred of them. I'll, I'll give you 2000 right? or, or $200. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like that's uh do it, man. Like yeah. uh, read, read as many as you want. <laughs> that's right. And when they get older, the number might have to be different, but yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to, to kind of highlight something Jonathan mentioned, you know, someone close to him, very close, you know, developed depression in his, in their thirties. So thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry to hear that Jonathan. Um, but hopefully it relates to what you're saying. And Jonathan also was saying, Ian, you have learned a lot of life lessons that it takes people a lot longer in their life to learn. So um, thank you for sharing that, Jonathan. Um, hey, yeah, no, it's, um, 
I've just gotten, I've gotten myself into a lot more trouble than a lot of people usually do. <laughs> so, um, because of that, uh, it, it's necessitated a bit of learning. Um, and sometimes it's a little bit of hard knocks and sometimes it can be a bit grace, a, a little bit more graceful, but, um, I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, keep the comments coming. we got some great ones coming. I wanted to talk about you know, scaling this, right? You talked about maybe 40 grand year one and mm -hmm. doing a couple million somewhere in that top line. We were talking backstage about lots of things, sales process. Um, tell me about like, you not only did your sales process evolve, but uh, since we're in the backup and disaster recovery world, since a hurricane's happening right now, tell me mm -hmm. about how that evolved and what did, you know, what did you use and what were, what were your challenges? Oh yeah. So I'll, I'll date myself, right? Like when I got involved in, uh, in, um, managing backups, it was like LTO backups, not LTO number, just LTO backups. <laughs> good old, good old tape. Um, yeah. tape was, tape was King. So when, when we started involving ourselves in client backup, it was usually managing their backup, um, their backup suite, which had been installed or set up by others, uh, mm -hmm. which um, was a lot of Symantec or Veritas. Backup exec was our jam for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And then when we started centrally managing it, and I, um, I forget the product name, this is how long I've been out of, uh, out of the tech space, but there was, um, it was part of Microsoft System Center. Maybe someone can throw it down in the chat. But there was a, a Microsoft System Center product, so we bought some System Center licenses. We installed it everywhere, and then we did some uh, some crazy VPN uh, stuff back to our own private cloud, and had a had a tape library, and we're doing direct to direct to disk with some tape tape archiving. There's a whole bunch of overhead, capital, and labor to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then some you know some BDR products started coming out. Uh, we signed up with a with a company called ca uh computer associates they had a little platform called arcserve which still exists today yeah. we use that for most of my tenure and then um near the near the end of my owning doberman we had we had moved to enable on our rmm and they had a direct to cloud product and it was a hey there's one throat to choke here and so we we did that um well, I, I never met Damien while I was uh while I was running my MSP, or else we would have we would have been uh, given in Servosity a look after after hearing about everything you guys are doing. But the the big things that I always struggled with was so ArcServe was a was an enterprise product that kind of got we shoehorned it similar to that Microsoft product. It had it had all the things that I thought were necessary, like testing and validation, remote environments, virtual spin ups, stuff like that. The big thing that I always struggled with was sometimes we just had to BMR a server, right? Like someone gets hit with a ransomware or a raid array fails or whatever. And you're just like, all right, this server is hosed. Okay. We've got to BMR this thing. And there's four terabytes worth of data here. And then you got to go talk to that client and go like, hey, yeah, okay, well, we got to restore the server from ground up and you're going to be down for two days mm -hmm. while this goes through. And man that conversation sucked yeah. every single time that conversation sucked and backup was always on paper. It really looked super profitable when you looked at my books, when it came to hard costs versus revenue, but mm -hmm. the soft cost portion of that and the payroll and just the, the gray hair stress level of backup, man, like that, it felt like a loss leader for me every single day. And a lot of that was like technology and lack of understanding and just lack of, again, process and procedure and system control. And it got a lot better near the end of it. Like we, we really knuckled down and focused on that. But I remember some, some white knuckle nights where after some update went sideways and you're like looking at the looking at the backup and then the backup job doesn't restore the first way. And mm -hmm. you got to like dive in and become a, a programmer and a developer and a, and a high end system engineer in this product line that you kind of know enough about to be dangerous, but not enough to do what, what you needed to do and diving into tech nets and stuff like that, trying and hoping and praying to get these servers back. And that sucked. So <laughs> don't do that. You take nothing away. Don't do it the way that I did it. 
<laughs> like, go find it. a partner, go find a professional and bring them in and have them help you do this right. Instead of thinking you can do it all by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. There's some good, really great options out there, but yeah, it's a, it's a lot of people in process is what I, I've, I've never met an MSP that scaled that didn't run into those. Uh, mm -hmm. So just to segue, this show is actually brought to you by Servocity. So if you're interested in uh, having your backups managed for you. That's what we do. Servocity Safe allows you to cut your support tickets in half by letting us manage all of your backups. We proactively manage them. We do daily testing of every single volume, not just screenshots, every single day. And then we store it in audited, third-party audited immutable storage, which means it can't be deleted by anyone. The real big difference is it's now our job to proactively fix the backups and not your job to babysit them. So that leaves you and your techs free to grow and scale your business. So you get not only our tech, but our people and our processes. So if you're tired of dealing with uh, failed backups and worried about the ability to restore, visit spacity.com slash call. Have, that will give you the opportunity to book a conversation um, and a call with me. I uh, look forward to speaking with you. So, um, so uh, let me switch over and we'll take a couple more um, kind of Q and A. Um, there's some others I want to get to. There's some great stuff coming out of this. Um, thanks for your question. You just dropped in, Jimmy. This is basically Datto plus Backup Radar. Um, those are probably two of the better products in the market. So I've been called worse. Um, that's a, a fantastic question. Um, reach out to me and be happy to kind of show more detail. It, it is all centralized, but uh, not finger pointing. We don't just manage anything for you. It's our, our platform and our tech and our people. So we've got everything from one person MSPs to 85 person MSPs. And I've yet to see one that says we test every single volume every single day. We have a process. So I, I was an MSP that lost data. That's why I'm so obsessed about this. That's my quick story. So uh, thank you for that softball pitch. But basically, that's why I'm so obsessed. And I've yet to meet an MSP that has the people in process rigor and doesn't have some white knuckle nights that there's just no reason you need to do that when I seriously doubt backups are your number one differentiator. So mm -hmm. thank you for that. And thank you for what you were saying, Ian. I know we have a few minutes left and I wanted to talk about something else. Um, and it's going to show up as an unknown user, but I'm going to feature their comment anyway on LinkedIn because I think this is kind of tying what you're talking about. So Ian, when did you realize that burnout was real? Um, yeah. And what, and I know you kind of led up to, I built this MSP for mm -hmm. those that just joined us. And, you know, at one point, it, it, I think there's a couple of things. One, you weren't making much money. You had a $2 million mm -hmm. MSP making very little. And then you advanced the MSP. So business-wise, you're doing great. These are my words, not your words. Um, but then, you know, at a certain point, you're burned out. You're thinking, this isn't me. What do you do? Yeah, How did you realize so there's that? like there's two types of burnout too. So um, you've got that entrepreneurial or leadership burnout, which hit me, and then there's also that burnout that your team will experience, um, and it can manifest in a lot of different ways. We had a uh, like MSP, like being in the MSP game is hard. Yes, um, I haven't I haven't met like emergency plumbers. <laughs> Um, interventional cardiologists, ER doctors, uh, police, firefighters, like some of those other high impact, super high stress things. And, you know, like in an MSP, like thankfully most of our days, we're not going into a fire or getting a gun shot at us or something. So I don't want to, I absolutely don't want to take anything away from first responders, police, fire, et cetera. Those, those guys are heroes. That's exactly. But, but that stress cortisone level, the, the body works in the same way. Mm -hmm. And I've yet to, I never once had a day at my MSP where I had a phone call with someone who was like, Hey, we're having a great day. And we just wanted to tell you that we love you and you're awesome and keep up the good work. See you later. Have some cookies. <laughs> that didn't happen. Um, and so if that's happening at your MSP, don't listen to me. Just keep doing what you're doing. If you're getting those phone calls. Like every time someone called me, they were upset at the politest and pissed off usually. Yep. And it felt like a lot of the times they were blaming us for their system dying. It's like, man, I didn't come into your network with a little hammer and go, 
ha, I bet you that'll mess up your day. It'll break <laughs> your server on you or break your desktop on you. It just like that happens. It's the reason why we all have jobs is this tech is hard. Right. Um, but it's you got to so recognize, hard. yeah, as the CEO, you're insulated from that. Like mm-hmm. you, you're not taking those phone calls every single day and getting hammered by pissed off user after pissed off user after pissed off user. So your service desk team, they, those guys work hard mm-hmm. and giving people, um, we, uh, we, we really tried to like, we used anonymous questions in, in the MSP. So we allowed anonymous feedback. It was truly anonymous. So we made sure that it wasn't in a way that we could figure out who said it. Now that being said, with small teams, so you can, especially if it wasn't just a, a numeric rating, if someone wrote a comment, you can kind of infer who it came from. But um, making sure that you gave people the platform and the space to give feedback, to talk about stress level, um, mm-hmm. you know, the, the typical things, company outings, perks, that type of stuff. But the number one way that I found to counteract it was to just sit people down, make sure to reinforce when they're doing a good job, have that one-on-one FaceTime with the boss. Um, and if you're a larger MSP, I understand like it's impossible for the CEO to go meet with every single person, but instilling your managers, your mid-level leaders, et cetera, like, hey, let's go meet with people and see how they're doing right. and what support they can do. And so if someone doesn't follow a process or makes a mistake or screws up, instead of saying a disciplinary thing, it's a, like, uh, hey, Damien, I noticed that we didn't follow this process. I wanted to review it with you. I wanted to review the resources and I want to help to make sure next time we do Mm -hmm. like help, help me help you Jerry Maguire land. Like that's, that's kind of the, the key piece is you have to approach things through a coaching and support mechanism. And, and it, that starts at the top through the CEO. And one of my greatest regrets and failures at my MSP is I did a absolute crap job of doing that all the way up until exit. Mm-hmm. And only after getting out of that house and looking back in and having some um, some conversations around that and, and some learnings and some lessons and some intentional focus on that day, I realized how badly I did mm-hmm. at that. And um, just give your like, cr- like that's you. That is your most important resource is that team. Um, entrepreneurial wise, like. I don't know the indicators of it, but if you're dreading going to work more than you're enjoying going to work, if work's feeling more like a chore, if there's days upon days where you're not having like that sense of elation or excited or excitement, if it's just like, man, I just got like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the clock. When can I get out of here? When can I get out of here? Those are some of the feelings that, were happening at me at my MSP. Mm-hmm. So like if you're starting to feel that way, that points towards a, a renewal cycle problem. And I think the way that you can get burned out, there's a, there is a cliff, I think, with everyone where if you've gone past that cliff, you're just at the, you know, like, hey, uh, to heck with this, I'm done. Mm-hmm. And um, that, that does seem to be like a one-way door, but I think you got a lot of runway there. So just recognize if you're starting to feel burned out if you're feeling overwhelmed if you're if you're getting frustrated more than you're getting happy then um try to figure out that renewal cycle i think that's the the big key piece the other part is you gotta enjoy what you do so i stopped enjoying technology a long time ago and because of that i I was not appropriate to own and lead a technology company yeah, you got to enjoy what you're doing, and that, so when I when that, I recognize that, that really firmed up. Like, hey, you got to sell this thing. That sounds so obvious, but it can be so hard to come to that conclusion and admit, especially when it's your baby. It feels like it's part of you, mm-hmm. right? Yep. Um, yeah, and it's it's not a failure. It's just that's just hey, man, it's that's human. It's time to move like, on. Look at look at everyone else's career too, like. One big thing is you don't have to have an exit from your MSP be your only exit. Mm -hmm. You're allowed to sell your business and start another business. You're allowed to sell your business and go get a job. You're allowed to like, you're allowed to reinvent yourself. Look at 
the average career path of someone where they'll have gone from like what, six or seven companies. Mm -hmm. And then you get us, these CEOs who'll found the, found a company and it's like, Nope, I gotta, this has to be my unicorn or whatever. 25 years later doing the same thing. Yeah. Who says, who says this can be your only rodeo? That's right. Like you're the one who told you that you're the one who put those handcuffs on, like take them off and go do something different and, and find something that, that creates some passion. So. Well, speaking of that, tell us what you're doing now at Richardson and Richardson Consulting and how that ties in or could help MSPs. Yeah. I think yeah, this it's... will really help them, but also feel free to give the shameless plug. Like, I, let everybody know what you're up to today. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I, that's, uh, so, so Richardson and Richardson, Carrie and I um, founded, it, founded that company last year. We're a, a multidisciplinary business consultancy. And what does that mean? It's it means that we that we help entrepreneurs. That's our real mission is to help entrepreneurs succeed. And if we're able to help enough entrepreneurs succeed at their missions, the world's going to change. That's that's the goal. We have a, a BHAG of influencing and impacting a thousand organizations in 10 years, and we're working towards that. But if you're struggling in your MSP, it's my privilege to help. And whether that's through strategic planning or through some coaching, some accountability items, whether you've got some problems in process, that's really one of my superpowers and getting that stuff documented, that might be something. Or if it's more, uh, hey, like we're struggling to grow, we're stuck in the mud, that's kind of Carrie's superpower. So when it comes to marketing and sales, business development strategy, those are really our our big core focal focal areas. Um, and if you if you head to our website, rnr.consulting, uh, and if you do forward slash connect, that syncs up to my calendar. I'm happy to spend time with anyone on the call. You can you can always grab um, you can always grab a little bit of time. Grab 30 minutes. Let's chat. Let's see if there's an opportunity where where there might be some some way for me to help. So. Yeah. Yes, if you guys got value, last last call for some questions. Also hit like, and that also uh, the thing I know about Ian is he gives first. So rnr.consulting.com um, and then slash connect. I think if they want to be able yeah, to get time. Yeah, rnr.consulting no dot com. It's one of those Thank that you. pesky that pesky top level domain, man. We were yeah. like, hey, let's get rnr.com. Nope. Yeah. rnr.consulting.com. Nope. 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 It's like, all right, we'll just do rnr.consulting and. I'm paying for it today. R&R.consulting. So um, reach out, I think, slash connect if they want to be able to get Tom. I know Ian to give his time and be able to help you. So whether you do any business or not, he will give and a great person to connect with. And his wife, he keeps mentioning Carrie, some of you may not be familiar with, is built an amazing sales and marketing company that has grown uh, vendors that sell to MSPs and tons and tons of actual MSPs. So if you're struggling with sales and lead gen, you know, she's amazing. And I say that because I hired her myself and she grew our business. So I can say that directly before I ever knew Ian. So, so they're amazing. Um, and I wanted to just thank you for your time. Matthew is saying, thanks. Great, uh, info. I really sincerely appreciate giving of your time to this community and audience today, Ian. Uh, I think it's rare to find somebody that has all the accolades, but is willing to be vulnerable and authentic. And, um, and that's what has been so amazing. Um, I wanted to just also mention, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for giving your time here, Ian. So I appreciate oh, that. Hey man, thanks. Thanks for having me on. I, uh, I appreciate the opportunity. This was fun. We'll, we'll do it again sometime and just, if nothing else, like none of us are alone. So like just reach out and talk to someone if, if something's going on if you're struggling and struggling in business struggling in life just go talk to someone that's right Our, hardest part is letting the air out of the balloon right, that's right. like open up your mouth and tell tell, tell the problem yeah. let it go that's that's right so reach out to you and reach out to me if i can help in any way uh, we'd love to i'm going to be a good steward of your time um and uh and so um on that note um Thank you, Ian. You're a true inspiration for Morgan. Um, thanks for talking about the heavy stuff. Um, so oh, thank for you sure. for your time today, Ian. And um, as far as uh, other details, if you missed anything, if you'd like the recording, if you'd like a transcription, we are going to, my team at Stravosity is going to comb through this, every book, every link, 
uh, get you connected to Ian. Anything you'd like, email show at DamianStevens.live. That will let you get notified of anything coming up, but we'll give you the whole recording, transcription, and all the goodies from this amazing episode with Ian Richardson. Uh, if you're interested in talking to me, you can go to Savasi.com slash call and get directly on my schedule and have a conversation about how we could help you not worry and stress about backups and truly scale your MSP. And lastly, make sure to hit follow uh, uh, on my LinkedIn or at DamienStevens.live to get directed there to um, make sure you get notified about future shows. If you know somebody that we should be interviewing, um, ping me and I'll make sure to uh, consider that. Thank you guys for the amazing community and comments today and have a blessed day.